Hello, my name is Dave Allen. I work for a company called Integrated Laboratory Systems. We are the contractor providing support for the NTP's interagency center for the evaluation of alternative toxicological methods. Today, I'm going to be providing an overview of available alternatives for eye irritation testing. First, a little bit about NICEDM. Um, it is at the National Toxicology Program at Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. It's a division as part of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, one of the uh, many institutes within the National Institutes of Health within the United States. Um, my company, ILS, provides technical support for NICEDM under an NIEHS contract. NICEDM itself does a number of different things, but among those provides support for an interagency committee within the U.S., which I'll speak about on the next slide provides support for the TOX-21 consortium that includes member agencies from EPA, FDA, the National Center for the Advancement of Translational Sciences, as well as the National Toxicology Program, and is certainly involved in a number of international harmonization efforts. Presented on the slide here, the, IL, or the, the NICEDM team, uh, which includes um, three folks from the National Toxicology Program. Dr. Warren Casey directs NICEDM. He's pictured in the lavender short sleeve shirt in the front, and then Dr. Nicole Kleinstroyer in the pink shirt beside him is the deputy director at NICEDM. The remainder of the team are ILS contract support staff. There is a law called the ICAM Authorization Act of 2000 within the U.S. Um, that provides guidance and direction for uh, member agencies to establish wherever possible um, efforts to harmonize the identification of test methods that either reduce, refine, or replace the use of animals and uh, that also ensure human safety and product effectiveness. Originally, the ICFAM Authorization Act included 15 member agencies. We added a 16th, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, last year, and you can see those 16 agencies presented on the slide. Also included at the bottom is a hyperlink for more information on ICFAM. So a brief outline of the slides I'll present today. Why do we need these data to begin with for eye irritation testing? The in vivo rabbit eye test itself. The need for available alternatives, those available now and might, what might be on the horizon. The concept of combining data from multiple sources, keys to successful implementation of new approaches, and next steps. So back in uh, the early part of uh, the 20th century, around the 1930s, there was a tragedy um, associated with a cosmetic product um, that was focused for eyebrow and eyelash cosmetic indications. Um, you, know, you can see the advertisement here for what was called lash lure. And effectively what happened was there were severe allergic reactions, pain, blindness, and even in one case death associated with this cosmetic ingredient. And this was one of the primary uh, events that occurred that resulted in the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which uh, founded the U.S.'s Food and Drug Administration in 1938. As a result of tragedies like this, there have been a number of regulatory toxicity testing methods that were developed, specifically in this case for acute eye irritation or corrosion. You can see there are national within the U.S. and internationally harmonized test guidelines that provide guidance and information on how to conduct these in vivo rabbit tests. So you can see uh, on this slide presented the, the way the rabbit eye test is scored. Effectively, the rabbit is dosed with 100 uh, microliters of a substance, and they're observed over a period of up to 21 days for um, effects on the cornea, the iris, and the conjunctiva. There's a subjective scoring scheme, and you can see those listed here associated with opacity of the cornea or corneal cloudiness. Um, the iris, uh, swelling and uh, inflammation of the iris itself, um, and then redness and swelling associated with the conjunctiva. And again, you can see the scoring from least to most severe, um, one all the way up to, in some cases, four that's used uh, in hazard classification and labeling. 
on this slide, you can see the relevant U.S. and international um, classification systems, and you can see the, the classifications themselves are based on the effects seen in those subjective scoring that I mentioned on the previous slide. Category one being the most severe or corrosive, um, meaning in irreversible destruction of the ocular tissue. Um, it could be a very severe reaction at the onset or one that a, a more mild reaction that does not reverse within the period of 21 days. And you can see the classification, uh, the classifications associated with less irritating compounds as you move down the scheme. Likewise, the globally harmonized system for classification and labeling is an international system, which, like the EPA system, grades um, the, the, current, the impact on the in vivo test um, from category one, the most severe, all the way down to not classified in this system. So before we move on, a, a brief commentary on the, the DRAE's eye test itself and what can be seen um, with these data as you look more closely and the reproducibility of the DRAE's test itself. A recent assessment by Tom Luckefeld, published in the journal All Text, and you can see the citation at the bottom, used conditional probabilities um, of DRAE's tests where there were substances um, with multiple DRAE's eye test studies. Um, Dr. Luckefeld looked across the European Chemical uh, Hazard uh, Agency and identified 491 substances that had at least two DRAE's eye studies. He then evaluated condi conditional probabilities to see based on a, a prior result, what's the likelihood of the same or different result of a subsequent test. For example, you had, uh, if you can see the category one, um, there were 46 substances that had multiple DRACE tests that included at least one category one response. But then you can see uh, the results associated with those, of those uh, 46 responses, 73% of the time, you, you would expect to see the same category one response. But if you look all the way to the right, circled in red, um, you can see 10% of the time you would actually get a not classified result or non-irritating. Similarly, if you look at the moderate and mild irritant classification schemes, um, a category 2A is a moderate irritant. You would see 30, about 33% of the time you would expect the same result. But almost 60% of the time, you would get a not categorized, not classified response. <clears throat> so with that in mind, um, the ICFAM committee published a strategy earlier in January of 2018. You can see the hyperlink at the bottom of the slide for more information on that document. You look towards uh, new approaches that do not require animals and provide equivalent or better protection of human and environmental health. And in implementing this strategy, there are a number of uh, um, guidances provided from ICFAM um, and the way those new approaches will be implemented. First and foremost, coordinating those activities through ICFAM work groups, um, creating a catalog um, of scoping documents to identify the, the context of use or required eye irritation testing in this case, coordinating efforts with stakeholders, certainly the, the critical need for identifying and curating high quality data from reference test methods with which to compare new approaches, obviously identifying and evaluating new approach methodologies, and then ultimately gaining re regulatory acceptance and facilitating their use. There is a work group comprised of ICFAM agency experts associated with ocular and dermal irritation. You can see uh, here the scope and charge for that group. There are sponsor agencies for this work group, the Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission that initially identified a need to create this uh, work group of experts. And you can see the, the three overarching charges to this group, a scoping document, again, um, that outlines the context of use and specific requirements, 
for um, U.S. and as well as international regulatory authorities for skin and eye irritation corrosion. Evaluating available non-animal approaches, be it in vitro as well as in silico or computational approaches. And lastly, uh, a roadmap and strategy specific to eye irritation and corrosion testing, which is really the form of this implementation plan I referred to earlier. Pictured on this slide are the experts and the relevant agencies across the U.S. federal government associated with the ocular and dermal work group, and you can see it primarily represented from the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the U.S. Department of Defense, the Environmental Protection Agency with offices of uh, toxics as well as pesticides, Food and Drug Administration, including Centers for Drug Evaluation and Research, and the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. Um, and then uh, international partners are also included, uh, Dr. Joao Barroso from the um, European Reference Lab, and then the ILF support staff. So a number of U.S. agencies, and clearly, as you would expect, those included from the work group um, require eye irritation uh, data, and in all cases associated with hazards associated with eye irritation. You can see the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the Department of Defense, and the Food and Drug Administration just are looking to identify irritants and corrosives. EPA, of course, with their classification system has a four-category system from corrosive all the way down to virtually non-irritating. And then the Occupational uh, Safety and Hazardous administration um, follows the UN's globally harmonized system for classification and labeling I mentioned earlier. So again, I mentioned at the outset one of the primary charges for the ocular and dermal irritation work group was to create a catalog of agency needs. And just earlier this month, that overview manuscript for U.S. requirements has been um, accepted for publication in cutaneous and ocular toxicology. So now we turn to the available alternatives to the in vivo rabbit eye test, and there are many, certainly in, in ranging in complexity from simple cell systems all the way to um, or uh, very complex and histologically similar in vitro models. Certainly monolayer cultures that rely on cytotoxicity assays like the neutral red release um, and the short time exposure assay. Organotypic models that look uh, that, that leverage uh, ex vivo approaches to ocular tissues, including the bovine corneal opacity and permeability assay, the isolated chicken eye and the porcine cornea reversibility assay. Um, Three dimensional human corneal epithelial uh, reconstructed human corneal epithelial models uh, commercially available, such as epiocular, uh, skin ethic HCE, and the vitrogel eye uh, irritation test. And then others, uh, perhaps less common, but also available that rely on um, tissues from the Hinzeg test um, and kit-based membrane assays, such as the OptiSafe and the ocular ear detection. Computational chemistry approaches such as QSAR and, and certainly many others on the horizon. So, at, at the outset, keys to successfully implementing these types of approaches again, reliant on the identification of high quality reference chemicals, um, getting engagement early and often from reg relevant stakeholder sectors. <clears throat> certainly, we have seen that collaboration among these groups is key and combining the resources available from all groups is, is critical. Um, again, the need for high quality data from four alternatives provided from industry and other tech me test method users. Um, clearly, there needs to be a sufficient alternative test method pipeline, which in this case, as you can see, that, that seems to be the case. Um, appropriate coverage across the chemical space for regulated products, and last and certainly but not least, international, both national and international harmonization of acceptance of these.
So uh, just a few additional details on the types of methods available. With monolayer culture systems, there are adopted uh, test internationally harmonized test guidelines from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD. The fluorescein leakage test method for specifically identifying uh, ocular corrosives and severe irritants, as well as the short time exposure test for um, identifying those serious uh, uh, ocular irritants, as well as those that don't require any classification at all. Um, in many cases, these are epithelial cells. In most cases, I should say these are epithelial cells. They could be the primary cells or immortalized cell lines. Um, skin keratinocytes, as well as corneocytes, um, even kidney epithelial cells in some cases. Um, and clearly, those are monolayer cultures on either um, plates or tissue culture inserts. Um, the endpoints are variant, variable. Many measure cytotoxicity. Others measure uh, permeability of a marker dye. Um, but in most, if not all cases, the, the assumption is that chemicals causing eye damage or irritation will induce cytotoxicity and or sufficiently disrupt the epithelial barrier function in the cornea. Ex vivo corneal eye models, as I mentioned, are those that are uh, leveraged the actual ocular tissues themselves. In most cases, tissues obtained from um, butchers or other food source, food production sources. Um, pictured here is the bovine corneal opacity and permeability assay. Um, but it, in most cases, these are objective ways to assess corneal injury, specifically corneal injury. Um, opacity, again, uh, corneal cloudiness can be measured by the amount of light transmitted through the cornea. Permeability can be measured by the amount of a marker dye that penetrates through the cornea. Um, and you can, again, you can evaluate these effects using corneas from food production animals like cows, chickens, or pigs. Um, and then you can create a quantitative score based on these parameters. Um, and most recently, a, a porcine model has been developed that, is, that actually assesses reversibility of corneal effects based on fluorescein retention. Um, most of the other models are short-term assays um, that aren't, uh, in fact, able to demonstrate reversibility. Um, and there, is, uh, uh, there are OECD accepted test guidelines for um, the uh, bovine corneal opacity permeability assay. Um, again, uh, another ex vivo model uh, is a whole eye model as opposed to just the cornea. Um, this is the uh, isolated chicken eye is presented here. There are models based on chicken and rabbit eyes. Um, you can see the eye is placed into a holder. You can dose directly onto the surface of the eye. Um, they drip saline across the eye to mimic tearing across the eye. Um, and then you can actually observe microscopically um, across each of the setups. You can see each one of these chambers here, there's, there's an eye um, that can be dosed, so up to 10 um, samples in this case. Um, and then you can look at both fluorescein penetration. You can see this is relatively um, non-irritating versus something very irritating, the level of um, fluorescein retention. And then you can use um, uh, measuring techniques microscopically to evaluate um, the extent of corneal swelling. But again, uh, you know, you're looking at the disruption of the corneal epithelium, swelling, as well as opacity can all be evaluated in this assay. Um, importantly, just like the previous assay, iradial or effects on the iris, as well as conjunctival injury is not assessed. And just like the BCOP, there is also an OECD test guideline for the isolated chicken eye test method. Reconstructed human corneal epithelium models are commercially available um, in uh, both the US and internationally. These are three dimensional human tissue constructs that are typically primary human cells or um, immortalized human corneal epithelial cells. Um, they are, rely on cytotoxicity, again, as the primary endpoint. 
um, and provide the capacity to evaluate uh, a time, either a times of toxicity or an extent of toxicity of, of a particular percentage comparing to control. Um, and again, this, this is predicated on the assumption that damage um, to the eye will induce cytotoxicity in either the corneal epithelium or the conjunctiva. And there is an OECD test guideline for these types of assays. And I, I mentioned also uh, macular, macromolecular assay systems. These are systems that are kit-based. Um, they don't require um, the, the setups associated with cell culture, a sterile microenvironment, and so forth. Um, and they do provide the opportunity to create a quantitative uh, uh, classification or scoring um, that can be um, tied to classification systems. Um, there's a mat in, in both cases, the ocular ear detection as well as the OptiSafe assay. There's a uh, uh, macromolecular membrane um, that you uh, evaluate the breakthrough time across that macromolecular uh, matrix and um, demonstrate changes in the peroneal protein structure that's quantified um, by turbidity associated with that membrane. Last but certainly not least are the um, quantitative structure activity relationship possibilities. And, and there have been many attempts to develop predictive computational chemistry models for eye irritation. Um, the most uh, recent to date uh, publications are included on this slide. Um, certainly, uh, you know, there are predictions that are compared directly with experimental data. And in, in both cases, there's typically noted uh, relatively poor predictivity of the reference test method or the in vivo, excuse me, in vivo method. Um, and, you know, in mo both cases or in, in all cases so far, QSARs have not been um, considered ready for implementation standalone, but might be useful for weight of evidence. But hard, going back to the discussion on the reproducibility of the animal test, it's also important to recognize that QSARs are only as good as the data upon which they are built. So if there are conflicting results in vivo and those results are used to build the QSAR uh, models, it obviously creates a, a situation where they may um, have a challenge with correctly predicting new chemicals. concept of integrating data from multiple approaches is something that's been uh, very active in the area of eye irritation, and OECD has a guidance document specifically for integrated approaches to testing assessment for eye irritation and corrosivity. Um, it's primarily, it's in three parts. First off, you would look at existing data um, or available non-testing data, such as um, QSAR properties, um, other physical chemical properties, um, utilizing read, read across, or perhaps bridging from other data that would be considered useful. Um, and then the next part would be a weight of evidence um, where you would collect all your available information and determine whether or not there's most li likely to be a hazard or not. Um, and then new testing, which is both could be both in vitro or in a very last resort, very specific situation um, in vivo. Um, importantly, um, the concept of utilizing in vitro and non-animal data all along the way to establish a hazard classification and labeling is emphasized. One of the challenges that's been recognized with alternatives to the in vivo test in recent history has been associated with agrochemical formulations. There's a number of publications that have come out that have demonstrated or, or questioned the applicability of available in vitro alternatives for the hazard classification and labeling of agrochemical formulations. You can see two of those publications presented here. So I, I mentioned earlier one of the keys to successfully Im implementing new approaches is public-private partnerships or including discussions with industry and the 
government regulators in helping to uh, ensure buy-in from both sides. So a recent example of such a partnership was with a consortium of agrochemical companies called Crop Life America, um, as well as the Environmental Protection Agency and NYSEDM. Um, and you can see the five uh, agrochemical companies as they existed at the time. The uh, data were provided from these companies uh, for approximately 200 pesticide formulations. Um, uh, and you can see here the, the breakdown of the types of data that were provided. And importantly, it was, they had both in vivo and in vitro data for these pesticides. And here's the matrix of data that was provided from each company, and you can see you know, certainly large numbers under each of the assays, but you can also see that there's very little overlap of the specific assays across the different formulation types. And the, the purpose of pulling all the data together was to see if we could develop an integrated or a defined approach um, made up of these five non-animal methods that would create a predictive strategy for hazard classification and labeling. Unfortunately, what we found was we were able to replicate effectively what was published on the manuscripts I showed earlier, um, but we're, there's, there really wasn't enough data to do additional analyses. Um, so just like has been published, a, a tiered approach using both the epiocular and the neutral red release appears to be a promising strategy, um, but not sufficient for all hazard categories. The BCOP, absent um, histopathological evaluation wasn't able to identify any of the uh, irritant agrochemical formulations. And the data set for the um, hen's egg assay or CAMBA as well as the isolated chicken eye were simply just too small to make definitive assessments. Um, and so a, a decision among this group was made to do some prospective testing to develop a data set across multiple in vitro assays in these agrochemical formulations for which there were already existing in vivo data. You can see the assays that were chosen for the assessment on this slide, um, many of which I've already spoken about, the BCOP, the isolated chicken eye, the phototoxicity assay, and the neutral red release, um, the epiocular, multiple protocols that are currently being evaluated, and the porcine model that looked at reversibility. Again, you can see the uh, impact of the co-organizers from both NYCETAM as well as PETA's International Science Consortium, and then the relevant stakeholders from um, the U.S. and Canadian regulators and industry. The agrochemical companies have generously donated coded formulations that could be shipped to testing laboratories. And we are focusing on the most common formulation types across the uh, agrochemical companies with the intent of the, the most data rich data set. You see the testing laboratories involved here. It's an inter international group of highly recognized experts in the contract research organizations. Um, and the National Toxicology Program is, a is providing the repository for the donated formulations and the coding process. So uh, an initial phase was a proof of concept to look at six formulations across the companies in each one of the assays. <clears throat> that testing has recently been completed, and while there was uh, none of the assays got all of the uh, formulations correct, also, none of them misclassified all the formulations. And given the small size of the data set, um, the agreement across from the validation management team was to include all of the seven assays in additional testing. And so accordingly, uh, an additional up to 40 agrochemical formulations will be tested in the second phase, starting with a, a subset of those to look at all methods again um, to see if um, the full set of 40 should be tested in all seven methods or not. Um, and that will be 10 formulations in phase 2A, and then possibly an additional 30 formulations in those methods selected based on that testing. 
And at present, the identification and finalization of that list, the formulations, is ongoing. So I mentioned earlier the importance of data collection and curated data sets. Um, again, you know, we've got obtained multiple conventional and antimicrobial registrants um, that provided data to, to uh, support ongoing efforts from the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and certainly processes associated with handling those data and any confidential information um, are carefully um, taken into account. Um, there's also ongoing um, collection of additional voluntary data submissions um, to expand those data sets. And NYCEDM and, and FISC have uh, been very active in um, requesting additional data from industry and industry consortia. So one example of a curated um, a data resource is NYCEDM's integrated chemical environment. And there's a hyperlink at the bottom of the slide to provide access to um, ICE, as we call it. Um, it is a, intended to be a resource, a publicly available resource for stakeholders for NYCEDM, so regulators, industry, and test method developers, um, and any other NGOs that might be interested. Um, it's, it's intended to be user-friendly for high-quality data and reference chemical data. Emphasis on um, ease of use to support prioritization and ex exploration of the available data. Uh, there is the, the primary um, focus of ICE as a data integrator, again, designed for ease of use and regulatory endpoints. And also, uh, lastly, the inclusion of computational workflows that are both um, that are web-based for ease of use, again, and data exploration. So briefly, the types of things that are in ICE, um, you know, data and reference chemical lists from validation studies. Uh, conducted by ICFAM over the many, um, since 2000, um, across a number of different endpoints. Certainly published data that have been uh, extracted, curated, and demonstrated as high quality. Um, a number of uh, databases uh, that I'll briefly mention shortly um, to ensure that relevant data are imported into ICE and avoiding duplication of effort. And again, computational models for things like physical chemical properties, or uh, in vitro to in vivo extrapolation. The types of data currently in ICE, you can see uh, respective uh, uh, data from a number of acute toxicity endpoints, um, as well as uh, data from endocrine disruption, um, both uh, androgen and estrogenic pathways. Um, high throughput screening data from both the ToxCast and Tox21 programs curated to uh, emphasize high quality, high throughput screening data. Data from a number of PhysChem properties um, that are predicted from computational tools, as well as data obtained from the Environmental Protection Agency on their six pack of acute toxicity endpoints for registered pesticides. So one example of uh, a computational model included in, in ICE is the Open QSAR app, or OPERA model. It's a collection of both uh, quantitative structure activity and quantitative structure property relationship models developed by Dr. Kamal Mansouri, and you can see a reference to a publication at the bottom. Um, it is a predictive model that's in ICE that provides a number of physical chemical properties for a library of over 700,000 chemicals. I mentioned earlier the curated high throughput screening data. Um, the intent here was to provide access to curated data that leverage the uh, chemical quality and associated data flags from the EPA's OxCast dashboard. And you can see a number of uh, activity calls or hits from the ToxCast assay um, data set that are omitted within the ICE data. Included here is an example of uh, excluding things based on um, only one point that falls uh, above a cutoff or below a cutoff. Um, certainly uh, outliers or extraneous data that can fall above a cutoff that provide access to an apparent curve um, or gain loss models that 
uh, going in a down direction and suggest a gain of signal and a loss of signal assay. So next steps in our process, of course, uh, looking at the feasibility of developing new approaches, um, particularly of those types of substances that are poorly predicted by existing models. Um, most importantly, reflecting on published uh, work in the literature as well as that OECD, and again, continuing to look at the variability of the animal test itself um, and looking for perhaps better comparators or better ways to develop models. Um, Investigating, incorporating additional data input such as physical chemical properties, um, and looking at more complex uh, computational approaches like machine learning, other uh, artificial intelligence where practically feasible. So, clearly, all of these ongoing efforts are reliant on the engagement and activity of a number of different organizations, and I've listed uh, many of those here. And I'll certainly be happy to take any questions on any of the information included in this presentation. I've included my email address. I'm happy to, for you to contact me directly. Thank you for your attention.